All right, let's get started. Looks like we got a decent group here. Um, so um, just to get caught up on the notes this week, you're studying about bond valuation. You should have seen that in 3013 as well. So it should we repeat stuff. What I encourage you to do on the bond valuations is go beyond just calculating the numbers. I give you the ability to calculate duration, which is good to do. Um, but you might, might also want to test a little bit. Uh, why do durations rise when interest rates fall? And why do durations fall when interest rates rise? You could actually test it with the actual example and just plug in numbers. Um, it's, it's an important concept. If you, if you want to take the CFA exam, the part two of the CFA exam covers what you're doing on, on that problem pretty heavily. A lot of discussion on convexity and duration. So try to go beyond just the class notes. Uh, after you do that problem, work through those problems. Um, also try to Google some of those terms like duration, convexity, and especially duration with, where you have Macaulay, modified, effective, you know, uh, spread duration. You have all these different terms. So um, what, what I have for you for the participation points is this problem that came from an exam from a year ago. So if you want to uh, copy that, snip that, um, it looks a lot like the exam question. The exam, I might actually go longer than two years. I usually do two years because a lot of, because on the exam, people are actually working it by hand. Remember, it's extremely important when you work these, you've got to do the entire, I want to see that entire table where you have time, cash flow, the discount factor, discounted cash flow, do, do everything. I don't want you, I know you can plug this in Excel and there's a formula and you can plug it into your calculator. You can certainly use Excel or your calculator to double check your answer, but I want to see you, uh, to me, it's more important that you understand exactly the mechanisms of it. I really don't care that you can plug something into a calculator because you'll never do that again after you graduate anyway. So it's kind of a wasted skill. I don't know they push it on the, uh, the, the, the exam. Um, I forget what they call that exam, but um, beyond these calculators really not that important. And actually be able to do these in Excel. Yeah, it's fine. Excel does the same fun function. I actually think you're better off doing the, the long formula I gave you all in the examples and see if you can do that from memory because if you can do it from memory, you probably understand what's going on. So this is a problem you should be able to do off the top of your head. You shouldn't need to look it up in the notes. So if you're having to look this up in the notes, that's not good. You're, if you're a finance major, especially finance or accounting, accounting majors should know how to do this as well. If you're marketing, you might be off the hook. Um, but if you're a finance major, this should just be second nature. How do you value a bond? Just basic, basic discounted cash flow type of stuff. So, um, you can see I give you a whole bunch of different spreads. So you have to know which spread to use. It's a 25 year bond, but it was issued 23 years ago. So that should tell you what you need. You notice there's 25s not even up here. So I didn't even give you that option. All right, so get these to me by say tomorrow at six o'clock or so. Um, if you wanna get, I give you, I give you participation if you, um, make at least a valiant attempt. You don't have to have it get it perfectly right. Um, but it's a good chance to see if you've been watching the class videos. The class videos this week uh, on the Tuesday class, I valued a treasury, which you don't need the spreads to do a treasury. And then on the Thursday class, I valued the uh, corporate. And then I showed you through the, took it through the index for the uh, FABOZI Handbook of Fixed Income. I've had a few students say, wow, you know, fixed income, that could be what I want to do because it's much more quantitative. There's a lot more numbers, a lot more modeling, a lot more statistics than you than you have on the stock side. And so this is a good chance to see what you think about bonds and get a little deeper than just the problem. All right, so I'm going to click off of this. Hopefully everybody's got that copied. Um, so the second thing I want to talk about, well, unless you have questions, any questions on the class material, pricing bonds? Anything on exchange traded funds or mutual funds or separate accounts? We got a question last week on uh, um, bundling um, 401k plans. Anything in the class notes up to this week? Anybody has? Uh, I showed y'all last week that article, set, series of articles I got from the CFA. I, sh I should have shown you more of it because as I went further through it, it was, they had a whole discussion on timber. Um, 
I mean, it's amazing how much just in the first four or five pages of that article was stuff we talked about in class. So, um, I mean, I'm not trying to prove to y'all that I'm making, I'm not making all this stuff up. I just get the impression some students think it's college class, so it's not important. So just ignore it. We'll learn the important stuff when we get out of college. And this is the important stuff. You just have to trust me. If it's not the case, 10 years from now, call me and I'll reimburse you for your tuition. But I'm quite convinced what we're talking about is what they're talking about in business. So, so learn this stuff permanently. Don't just learn it on the surface. So that brings us to a really good discussion on paper two. I really like paper two. It's not a very long paper. It's one you can definitely write this weekend and it's due next week. So you wanna get it written this weekend. It's one you can sit down and do fairly quickly. I've already assigned the companies to you. If you don't like your assigned company, you'll have to pick another one, but you have to pick one of the ones that have been assigned. Um, and then you'll have to change your discussion group. The reason I'm doing it by group is it, it's just too difficult for me to talk about four or five companies at once. I want to be able to take that 25 minutes that we have for each group and really talk about your company and give you some ideas on what to do. This YouTube video, I actually did this for you, but you should look at that and see how I was able to bring that data in. It's actually pretty, pretty cool that you can use Bloomberg to do that. So uh, maybe next semester sometime, you might find out what I'm doing. You know, if you like the data that's there, you might find, uh, you can find a really good use for that for, um, for your capstone class or another class. So you might, you know, keep that, keep that in your hip pocket to know. Uh, one thing I was going to do was the Bloomberg Intelligence um, because they have a real good write up on each company. But the problem is they didn't do Bloomberg Intelligence on the smaller companies like the, the TACO, T-A-C-O company. So since I didn't have it for everybody, I only did it, I didn't do it at all. Um, I did give you the conference calls, so I'd encourage you to get into that. Uh, this is a chance to uh, prove yourself. Go beyond, this, you know, students keep asking, hey, can we see an example paper for paper two? And I, boy, I didn't even like giving you an example for paper one. Um, so paper one, I gave you an example so you get used to my style. But now you know what I'm looking for, which is, incredibly deep critical thinking now stop and think what are you what are you writing about with your firm what could you do to enhance this analysis and that's critical thinking in critical thinking you've got to you guys got to step back and ask what would make this this communication more valuable so i i gave you the reporting earnings and expected earnings you'll notice in that um in that Excel, I'll have to load up one of those Excels so we can, we can see it. But you'll notice in that Excel, there is a couple of earnings numbers in there. So I don't know which company to pull up here. Well, I'll pull them all up because they're in there. So let me, let me just give you an example of this stuff. This is really cool. So I, I'm actually kind of jealous of you guys because uh, you, get, you get to do this paper and I don't. So I'm kind of upset, but... Um, Let's look at this first company, Intel. So you notice I picked companies whose earnings cause a huge impact on the stock. And Intel may be the most dramatic of all because this is a huge company and it fell 10%. <clears throat> That's huge. The market was expecting $1.10 and they got $1.11. So they actually beat and the stock fell almost 11%. That's why I picked it. And they, so you can see the same thing happened last time too. They beat and the stock price fell dramatically. You look at their revenues, they even beat on revenues both times and their stock price fell. They missed a little bit on margin, but they were over on net margin. And yeah, the stock price dropped dramatically. So I can't answer that, but that's why you got to go in. Uh, that's why I gave you the conference call. But all you got to do is just Google. If you go in and Google uh, Intel earnings release, and all kinds of articles will come up. Intel third quarter financial results, investor relations, Intel, why, why Intel sales are tumbling. Let me just show you, boy, it's amazing what, uh, y'all don't know how much easier your, your life is with that in mind. 
I didn't have any of this stuff. You know, not only had to go, I had to walk to school 20, 20 miles in the snow. We didn't have the internet either. Um, but look at this. You even have videos. Why Intel shares are tumbling after earnings report. What are you trying to answer in your paper too? You might want to answer, why did Intel shares tumble after earnings report? Now, is that the answer? You might disagree with them. But that's coming from Bloomberg. That sounds like a pretty good source. Jefferies, wow, that's a really good source. They dig into Intel's earnings. Well, all I did was Google Intel earnings release and 39 million things come out. Now, some of those may not be this current release. Um, is a lot of stuff comes in. So you have, you have plenty of resources. Try to figure out why did a firm that beat on earnings see their stock price fall so much? All right. So I'm actually pretty intrigued by that question myself. I'm hoping y'all answer that, those that are doing them. Were there any unusual items? So again, how can you tell there's an unusual item? So if you go back to the, the earnings data, um, which is where, oh, sorry guys, but if y'all could see what I'm seeing, you can see why it's so hard to tell. Um, oh man, where is it? Did I, oh, just a second, just a second. I must have clicked off the file for some reason. I don't know why I would have done that. So, um, I still don't see it. Yeah, that's not it. Boy, why can't I see it? It's just nowhere to be found. Sorry guys, this is really frustrating because I, I had the file open, but it doesn't show anywhere on the choice. All right, there it is, finally. Ah, my word. Okay, sorry guys. So if you look at earnings, you've got reported and comp. Comp means comparable. That's what you're actually writing about. You're writing about column F. Column F versus column G. But if there's a big difference between E and F, that means they had some unusual item that they normalized out. You can see there's a slight adjustment for Intel, but it actually made the earnings, it wasn't huge for, um, you can see a huge adjustment for uh, Best Buy or Beth Body, Beth Body, Beth Body or whatever it is. Um, pretty big adjustment there. Their actual comp was lower than the reported. That's unusual, it's usually the other way around. Here you see a pretty, pretty significant adjustment again, going the other direction. Their reported was 57 cents, but their comp was only 7.7 .7 cents. That's pretty amazing. So if you're doing Levi, you probably need to explain why does, why was the reported so different than the comp? And you'll see that in articles. So usually what you'll see in an article, it says, um, Levi reported 57.4 cents in earnings 7.7 cents after adjusting for X. And you have to just figure what that is. That's so Levi's the most, most significant adjustment. They still did well because the market was expecting them to lose money. They still did, still did well because they made money where they're expecting losing money. But there's a good 50 cent difference. I mean, that's a huge difference, isn't it? That's pretty major. Um, for... Uh, Domino's, not a big difference, $2.50, both of them. Taco, not a big difference, almost identical. Um, Philip Morris, a little bit of a difference, but not huge. J.B. Hunt, no difference at all, exactly the same. And then WBA, um, pretty big difference for them. They had a good 12 cent, or one, or 10 cent adjustment. For them, you notice, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, with, with Walgreens? Uh, I don't like Walgreens anymore. I had a bad experience with them yesterday, so I'll badmouth them. But um, you notice their reported number was worse than expected, but their comp number was better than expected. But the market reacts well. The stock price is up 5%, and they beat by about 5%. So you, you can tell the market's reacting to, to, the, um, to the adjusted number. That's what that comp means. Um, so that's what I mean by any unusual items. You look at the reported versus the comp, there's a big difference. You will see it in articles. 
Um, so a couple of them, there were not many big, were big difference. Most of them, there was a big enough difference. They'll probably mention it. And then you also want to compare it to the prior quarter of the prior year. So that's really important that you get, you get the right comparison. So when we go to Intel, we're not comparing Intel's earnings the last quarter. We're comparing Intel's earnings this quarter to last year because of the seasonality of earnings. And you can see their earnings drop pretty dramatically. So they beat this quarter by 0.82%, but how do you get the change? So all you do to do the change, you do the, to this quarter divided by last year's quarter minus one, you can see that their earnings is down 21% from last year. That's a pretty significant drop. So you're gonna look at this quarter versus last quarter, you wanna do the same thing. You wanna do the same thing for uh, revenue. The revenues were 19.9 billion. They dropped to 18.3 billion. Their revenues are down four and a half percent. So you want to talk about the percentage change from last quarter to this quarter. <clears throat> so you want to do that for both earnings and for revenues. So you have earnings, which is earnings per share reported expected any unusual items and then compare it to last quarter. And then you wanna to do top line, that's revenue, do the same thing. Make sure you do the same thing. Some students leave this out. Reported, expected, and versus a quarter last year, prior year. You don't wanna talk about all three of them. What did the report and revenues? Um, what was expected so for your company? You have an expected revenue number, uh, so make sure you talk. You talk all three of these things. You don't usually have any kind of unusual item. I've seen sometimes when reported earnings um, will be different than the comp will be different than reported, but that's pretty pretty rare. The next thing is to talk about margins. So all of y'all have gross margins and you have net margins. What you want to do here on, on these is remember what we talked about with basis points. So let's look at Intel's margins. So these are percents. So Intel's margins was 54.8%. They missed it by a mile. They, they expected, the market was expecting 57.053%. Intel got 54.8%. They miss it. How much do they miss it? Here, you don't want to do, remember these are percents, 57% and 54.8%. You don't want to talk about the percentage miss and the percent. So how do you do this? You do it in basis points. So 57 minus 54 is 253. So just take the difference since, remember basis points is 10,000, you know, it's the number divided by 10,000, so 0 0.0001. But this is 57%, but they don't have it in percent. So it's already divided by 100. So you only need to multiply. I mean, it's already multiplied by 100, so you only have to multiply 100. So, so you take, you all need to write this formula down. You take the difference. So you take their gross margin minus the expected gross margin, close parentheses, times 100. And that tells you in basis points that Intel, Intel missed expectations on gross margin by 225 basis points. All right. Someone do that for me for, um, for uh, Beth, Beth, Betty, whatever that is. I can't remember what the name of this company is. But BBBY, how did I do on gross margin? So you take the 35.884% minus the 31.164%. Since it's already not in percents, so it's already times 100. So I multiply by another 100. And 472, did they beat or miss? Estimates on gross margin by 472 basis points. All right. You see again why I'm using basis points for comparing two numbers that are both percents. 
to say that they beat by 15% is really confusing. It's hard to know. Does that mean they had 35 and the market was expecting 20 when you say 15%? So it gets really confusing. So they beat, they beat by four and that's pretty significant beat and their stock price was up. Wow. They're even more dramatic than, um, than, um, Intel, their stock price was up 25%. That's a firm we actually own them, and they're this is a firm that's priced to go out of business. Uh, but the market's getting a little exciting. Maybe, maybe they'll maybe they'll survive. I mean, how much money can you make selling uh, uh smelly soap? But you know, just it's not a it's a high margin business, but really low turnover, so it's a struggling, struggling business. All right, so you talk about gross margin, the exact same thing for net margin. Thing for net margin. Their net margin was um, that's not that's okay. Their net margins off to the side. Here I did it in percents. So their net margin was. So make sure you know on on when I give you EBIT or EBITDA off and call them in. I actually calculate their margins. How did I do that? Well, I have EBITDA. And I have revenue, so the EBITDA margin is just EBITDA divided by revenue. So anyone wants, well, I'll do this one. I'll let someone else do this next one. So when you have it already in percents, you do the comp minus expected, but now you got to multiply by 10,000 because it's in percents. And so they beat expected, EBBY beat expected net margin by 546 basis points. So the question is, does that mean they're gonna survive or is this just a last little bump for a firm on the way out, who knows? I only go to this firm when I go to Apple and they're fixing my phone and they say it take 45 minutes, I go next door to the BBBY and I buy some soap, put it in my car and that's the only time I shop there. Um, but. You know, it's, it's, it's a challenging industry, especially with a lot of the online kind of stuff. But it looks like they may be coming back. You can tell how bad it's been for them by just look at their revenue. Uh, their revenues used to be close to the four billion. And look at their revenue and look at that. They went and dropped. In the last quarter, they dropped from 2.6 billion in revenue to 1.3 billion in revenue, obviously because of COVID. Uh, but this is a firm that's definitely struggling but it looks like they're bouncing back a little bit. And so maybe, maybe they'll survive, but everybody sees that. I got, I've got the, um, on the page that says EBIT or EBITDA, depending on your firm off to the side, I have that margin. Um, you can also talk about the change in their margins. So this, this quarter it's 7.42%. Uh, Last year it was 5.4. Multiply that by 10,000. And their margins are up, their, their margin was up 202 basis points. So BBBY net margin is up 202 basis points from the same quarter last year. That's pretty significant, pretty impressive. All right. Well, I won't ask y'all to do that because we're running on time, but um, but you have that, anyone that you have that, Ibit or EBITDA, you have the margins on the top. You can see Levi's, why did I put them as uh, the market was expecting horrible stuff and actually had a pretty good quarter. 10, 11% margin is pretty impressive for any company. But when the market's expecting a negative 13% margin, that's pretty good. However, their margins are down from last year. So that's negative, down about 350 basis points, but that's negative. But here they beat by, I mean, you almost can't even calculate this one. They beat by uh, like, oh, I can't even do the number. Um, whoops, I did it. They beat by 2,400, you know, it's you can't even, 2,400 basis points. It's just crazy. On that one, I don't even know if I would talk basis points. I'm gonna just say the margin was expected to be negative 13%. It came in at 10.99%. I don't think I can talk basis points change because that's too hard of a number for us to really understand. All right, so your, your key is, Get, get the numbers um, all in there. So you're talking about them, talking about margins, net margins, and then try to get some words to it. Why were the revenues down? Why were the revenues up? Why did the margins miss? Why did our margins beat? 
And then what is management saying? That's why I gave you the conference call. So you can look at it. So what are analysts saying? That's why I say you go to Google and just type in um, Intel's or Walgreens uh, earnings release. Just see what people are saying, find some YouTube videos or whatever, bring it together and figure out what, what is the market thinking. And then you're gonna do the market's re reaction. How did your stock price react? So here, the key here is there's several choices. So if they reported, let's say I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do everything's October 1. Let's say your only choices are October 1, 2, or 3. Let's say they reported October 1 after market close. And you want to compare open on October 1, on October 2, to close on October 1, and close on October 2, to close on October 1. Why are we picking October 1? That's the last price we had before they release their earnings because they released earnings after market close on the 1st. So the price on October 1st at close did not know the market, did not know the earnings release. So we want that to be the last number before they released earnings. So the market's reaction is open on the 2nd and close on the section. Open on the 2nd, that's what we call, this is what we call the initial reaction. And then you have this, this is the final reaction for the day. And I've given you charts, we'll look at the charts, but yeah, you want to know their initial reaction, how did it open it, how did it react to open? And then their final reaction, how did it, how did it react uh, throughout the day? And you can also talk about the path throughout the day. I gave you a graph that, that does that for you. So you can look and see uh, did it just drop and stay down or has it moved around some? Um, so let's see, which one was it? A BBBY was the one that was 25%. Let's see if it was a straight up 25%. So they must have reported uh, before or open. They reported before open on October 1st. So the close on September 30th, you didn't know what the earnings report was. Then somewhere around, looks like at eight o'clock or seven o'clock, eight o'clock San Antonio time, but eight o'clock New York time, or seven o'clock New York time, they reported their earnings. And this reaction is pretty positive, continually positive. And then they closed up pretty high. It actually got even higher. It's pretty amazing. By noon, they're up quite a bit. That's a pretty different. And so, you know, you just look at that. Sorry. So they had gotten up to twenty dollars. They closed um, somewhat below that, but boy, a pretty hefty, hefty increase. Um, so you have to be careful. The close is right here at, at five o'clock New York time. This stuff after that is after close. So you can get the actual close from Yahoo Finance. So you don't want the close in after hours. You want the close as of October 1st at five o'clock or four o'clock San Antonio time, all right? So be real careful of that. So since they report are open on the first, then you want to compare open on the first to the close on the 30th and close on the first to close on the 30th. So you just got to ask, when was this reported? What was the price we had, the last published price right before they reported? And you want to compare that to the open and the close after the report. So you can get that. So for, for this firm, it actually reacted more strongly and came back down, but still pretty strong. Um, it actually closed at about where it, where it opened. It just kind of gyrated up and down. So um, compare that to a Levi. Here you can see Levi reported um, right at close on the 6th. You can see on the 6th when it closed, the stock hadn't reacted yet. So right after close, and it happens a lot. Market closes at five o'clock and they report at 501. And so you can see the market reacted. So what do you wanna look at there? You wanna look at close on the sixth to open on the seventh. Here you have the after hours. You can definitely talk about the after hours. The initial reaction was in after hours, after hour trading. 
but they close on the 6th way down here. After hours, you jumped up here, and then on the next day before market, they had this kind of reaction. And here's market open right here. The market opened really high, but you notice throughout the day, it fell off. It still ended up much higher than it closed, but it had been much, much higher throughout the day. So the market's initial reaction was very, very strong. Their final reaction was strong, but not nearly as strong. All right, are y'all seeing that? Any questions on that? Hopefully everybody's following me. I mean, I've done so much to work for you here anyway. I've given you all the data and the graphs, which is unfortunate. It'd been a good practice if you could have done this yourself. Um, but any questions on how I'm interpreting this? If you're not sure, call me which prices to compare to, but you can always tell, I think on every single one of these companies, you can tell when they released earnings. So yeah, you can tell they released earnings right before open on the 8th. So this is um, Domino's. So on the 7th at close, we didn't know the stock price I and mean, we didn't know the earnings. And then at eight o'clock before open on the 8th, that's when they released earnings, the stock price fell and it stayed down for most of the day. Didn't really move much even after hours. Uh, Taco, uh, looks like they reported right at open on the 16th. And so the market dropped. One thing that can help you is um, they give you this price change here. This price change, I don't know exactly from what point, from what point they do do it, um, but it should be in the ballpark of what you, what you have. But if you're not sure, call me. Don't lose points because you compare the wrong prices. And we'll get that, we'll, we'll make sure of that next week when we do the Zooms, we'll make sure everybody's using the same comparisons on those, but um, they're saying the stock price is down 21%. What are they comparing to? And I've never checked to see what Bloomberg's actually comparing to. It might be close to close kind of thing, but who knows? They may be doing close to open. Uh, they may be using some after hour numbers, who knows? But it, sh it should just be on that one day. They're not taking this more days than that. All right. So that's the market's reaction. So what do I mean by market reaction? Well, you have to definitely talk about your stock and how it changed, but you might look at the overall stock market, look at the S&P 500. You might look at a competitor. So Walgreens, the obvious example, look at what CVS did. Intel, look at what Texas Instruments did. Or as I said last class, if you're doing um, Intel, you could easily find an exchange traded fund that only does semiconductors and see what that ETF did on that day. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can do to give more. So, you know, Intel was down 10%, but let's say all semiconductors were down 10% that day. But that tells you something, but if semiconductors are up 3% and Intel was down 10, that's a pretty good evidence that was a horrible market, especially given that Intel is in that ETF and they're a big part of it. You would think they would influence the ETF itself and so, you know, you can, you can get a little bit of sense of, of how the market's reacting. Um, so I'd be really impressed if you do the market, the industry, and a main competitor. I would think that'd be really impressive. Um, I don't know who the main competitor for BBBY is, um, but, you know, you know, think of someone. If not, at least do consumer discretionary or something. There's, there's point. So go out to some of those websites I linked in the notes that have those ETFs and go to the sector or industry ETFs and you'll be amazed, you'll, you'll find one that's pretty close. Uh, one thing that's a little frustrating is because you don't have access to Bloomberg. If, if you type in your company, let's say you're doing taco. If you type in your company's ticker and then you do the function eight and then you type COMP and hit enter, it will bring up the return for your company and they will give you an index to compare it to. So if you're not sure what index to do, they'll give you an index and you can actually get the return of that index off of Bloomberg. So that is another way, but unfortunately we don't have, you don't have access to Bloomberg. All right, so talk about the market. That's where you can get a lot of critical thinking points. Um, you know, up here, it's really explaining it and finding some good articles and some good quotes. Down here, it's finding a way to show was the market reaction uh, logical, illogical? Was it bigger for this company and other companies? That kind of thing. Um, so 
that's it. That's your paper. It's really not that difficult a paper. It's a paper you could probably get a pretty good draft in two or three hours without too much trouble. Uh, not that you're trying to get the fastest paper in the world, but you can get a pretty good first draft. Um, so questions on paper two. Do you still want it formatted kind of like paper one was? Yeah, I would. Some of y'all, when you do the formatting, you're not doing the narrow margins or full justify. I would, you wanted to make it look, look, look as much like a professional journal as possible. So yeah, I would, I would recommend you do that. This is a good paper actually to put on LinkedIn because it's short enough that they'll probably actually read it. Um, and you can put some, this is a chance for you to show off, put some graphics in. I gave you the Bloomberg chart. Putting a Bloomberg chart into a finance paper is always impressive, even though the Bloomberg chart's a little messy looking. That actually is impressive for an undergraduate student to actually link a Bloomberg chart in their paper, but create other charts, a lot of quotes, that kind of, you know, this is a good paper. It's, it's short enough that they would be pretty impressed. It's also talking about individual companies versus paper one, where you're only talking about the overall economy. So it gives you something that really helps you when you're interviewing for jobs. Uh, we had the careers and finance class this last Monday and every single one, I didn't pay them to say it, but every single one of them said, yeah, writing papers and sweets classes and other classes, that, that was a, that made a huge difference. So if you got, you got classes, that's all multiple choice. And this is your chance to prove yourself that you can communicate, you can write. Um, so yeah, make it look as professional as you can. Other questions? All right, so next week we'll do the Zooms um, and be real important to hit your Zoom because I'm gonna go into each one of your companies in, in detail. We'll walk through this entire thing in detail, not to write your paper, but to make sure you're not, you don't have numbers. I would also recommend that before your Zoom, um, you have some of your sources that you thought were really good. So if you wanted to share them with other students, you could definitely do that. If you find a really good article you thought was great, a really good YouTube, you can share that on chat. Um, so, you know, feel free to do that kind of thing. All right. Um, so everybody saw what the participation points were for the day. Um, let's see if I can find it again. Yes, sir, can you put that up, please, for one more second? I'm sorry? Yes, sir, I was going to ask about that. Can you put, yeah, can you? Yeah, so you just have to get Thank this you. done by tomorrow uh, evening. All right, that's it. I'll stay around if you have questions, but that's all I have for today. So get your paper two written this weekend. Um, put a draft of it out there on, um, on Blackboard and we'll talk about it in our Zoom sessions next week. All right, thanks, Ray. Sorry, you, wanna, you said if we wanna change um, company just to do it before the actual Zoom class, correct? Well, email me so I can change your group so I can make sure to send you the Zoom information. I guess it doesn't matter though. I mean, if you, if you want to change, you, you could just show up in your, y'all know how to show up to the Zooms, right? You don't have to be in that group to get into that Zoom. So, um, but it, it would be a little better if you let me know. One of my concerns is we're going to have like 20 people in one Zoom and three in another one. Sure. I don't know. I don't know if I will change. I, I'm just thinking. Yeah. But thank you, sir. Sure. Professor Sweet, are you going to um, post this video on YouTube uh, for reference? Yeah, this one I, will. I didn't do last week's because it was kind of bizarre. So I just didn't, there wasn't much in it. But yeah, this week I definitely will. Okay, sounds good. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? It, uh, do we have, you said we have access to a Bloomberg machine through the UTSA library? Yeah, that's, that's the only one. And it was having problems before. Hopefully they fixed it. Um, I know Ramsey is trying to get access to the Financial Study Center, but um, I haven't heard back from him. And I know they're they were real picky with me that they wouldn't let me do it. Um, so yeah, it's I've been in there, but I can't let students in there with me. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Oh, uh, that's, that's a big part of this class, and unfortunately, you're missing out on that. So you need to kind of come back and not redo this paper, but at least do the data gathering part of this paper off of Bloomberg after the semester. Um, uh, sir, so, so like, I wanted to ask you, why are you like mentioning basis points on paper two? Because you're comparing margins. Margins are in percents. Remember, anytime you're comparing a percent to a percent, you want to use basis points. So if it's 37% and 35%, you don't want to say they beat by 
because we don't know what that means. You want to say you beat by 200 basis points. Earnings, you say they beat by 3%, 4%. That's fine. Revenue, you see they beat by 3%, 4%. Because those are in dollars. There's no problem. On gross margin and net margin, since they're in percents, you say they beat by 100 basis points, 200 basis points. Long yeah, we're talking about long interest long. rates, right? We're talking about the 10-year yeah. treasury, 2% versus 2.1%. You want to say it's it's ten basis points because you you have two percent. So anytime you have a percent sign, yeah, like right. it's not going to be specifically linked to the treasury stuff. It's basically just like using inches and stuff. So whenever you compare two percentages, they're going to use the basis points. Yeah, that's just the standard. There are some people that if it's two percent and three percent, and they'll say they beat by one percentage point. I've seen that one percentage point. That's a little clearer, but saying they beat by 100 basis points is there's absolutely no question. Everybody knows exactly what that means. Um, but I don't like saying yeah. they they beat by one percent if it's 30 versus 31 percent. That gets really confusing. So I don't I don't like that. You know, saying they beat by one percentage point, yeah, that's that's okay. But I, I like basis points better. Plus, it sounds impressive in your paper that you can handle basis points. So when your people are reading your paper for a job, and if it's 3.6%, then you're going to take 0 0.036 minus 0 0.046 times 10,000. And that's going to equal minus 100 basis points. But in Bloomberg, they don't give, they give you 3.6 versus 4.6. They've taken the percent and already multiplied by 100. Yep. It's so there you just take 3.6 minus 4.6 times 100 because it's already been converted and that equals minus 100 dips. All right. So on Bloomberg, I I did the net margin, so I already converted the net margins into percents. The gross margin though, Bloomberg shows that as 57.6 or 53.6, it's actually 57.6%. So you yep. just have to know they've already multiplied by 100. So you don't need to multiply by 10,000, you just multiply by 100. Yeah, hey, sir. Um, so what exactly is the comp on the... It means comparable. It's what, it's what the market's actually is expectations are for. I, I wouldn't call so it comparable. I would have called it adjusted. It's really adjusted. But for some reason, Bloomberg puts it as the comps. I don't, I don't know. That's that term. Just their comps, comparables. Um, okay. It's comparable okay. to the expected number because they may have some unusual items the market doesn't really care about. They know it's one time thing. So, because I, I just got a little bit confused because wouldn't we just like compare the expected to what they actually reported? No, that's or... not what the market does. The market market goes against the comp number. You'll notice okay. in Bloomberg, all of the percentages are against the comp, not against the reported. Uh, okay. I saw uh, Best Buy many years ago. I wish I, I could show you all this, but their reported was like negative $4 and their comp was like <laughs> positive $2. They have a, hmm. they had a massive ride, out, ride off. I don't know if it was a pension plan, something or other, but the market was excited because they beat. They reported uh, two, the market is expecting $1.90. I mean, their comp was two. The reported was negative four dollars, but their comp was two, and the market is expecting one point nine. The market essentially ignored that negative um, four. You talk; they talk about it in articles. That's why you'll see it in articles. They'll say, you know, they'll say Best Buy's earnings per share was negative four dollars, comma two dollars after adjusting for, and that's why I like to call it adjusted, not comp. And then the market is focused entirely on the comp. Okay, that makes sense then. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this paper. So y'all know that if you get in an interview, because uh, um, yeah, I would, a lot of people think it'd be reported number, but for some reason, the market is pretty easily sold. And the idea of management says it's, it's a temporary thing. They say it's temporary, so ignore it, take it out of there. We're valuing the firm going forward. The fact that some firms have temporary stuff that happen every single quarter doesn't seem to bother stockholders all that much. Hmm. Well, I definitely would have bombed that question. <laughs> Well, that's why we're doing the pre prep. We'll do it next week. All right. Which company did you get? Uh, I got the uh, poop. What the comparable to CVS? What is it? Walgreens. There you go. Walgreens. Um, yeah. 
I can't remember if Walgreens had a big adjustment. Um, Boots Allen, whatever they are now. Um, I don't think that they did. Yeah, they did. They did. Now, theirs is on the positive side. You don't normally see uh, – it's usually reported as um, – no, no, this is the right way. This is right. Sorry, I'm thinking backwards. Right. Usually the report is lower than the comp because everybody wants to say negative stuff's temporary and add yeah. it back. And it's good stuff. No, that's not temporary. We do that all the time. So I think it's somewhere in the 90th, 90 percentile or something that the adjustments are reported in comp is a positive adjustment. Five or six percent of the time, it's the other direction. You actually saw a couple here where it's the other direction. So yeah, you got, um, that's, it's not insignificant. And, and that's what I was mentioning, you know, they beat on comp, but they're under or reported, but you can see Bloomberg has it against the comp. They have it as a positive 5.9. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, because, all right, okay. Because I was a little confused when I was first looking through the Excel spreadsheet, kind of it like, what are all of these things? Obviously the reported and the estimate, but I've never seen comp before in my life. <laughs> yeah. And there's some people don't like, um, I started in my screen analysis class pulling in adjusted numbers. Uh, but uh, Sarah liked them. She's a, an accounting professor at UTSA who's wonderful. If you ever get her class, she's incredible. Uh, but she has the exact opposite. She says on the accounting side, they don't, they don't trust comp because it's, they think it's management manipulating the numbers. <laughs> there's a lot of debate. She worked for the SEC for some time, and there's a lot of concern at SEC of firms putting out these comp numbers. Uh, and is is it true or is it management deception? So it's not. There's not universal that adjusted numbers are the right numbers to use. Yeah. Like, where do they even get the actual comp number for? Like, it, well, what's the formula? Management will tell them unusual items, and it's up to the market to decide. You'll see different comp numbers depending on what article you read, just like you get different estimated numbers. That's the reason I'm using Bloomberg, so everybody has the same numbers. But you might read an article that says their comp was a dollar five. Oh, okay. Because they're adjusting for something that you're not adjusting, that this group isn't adjusting for. The reported is reported. That shouldn't change yeah. between report, but it's possible the comp and the estimate can be different in different articles. Okay, that makes that makes sense. They're they're all just subjective. Yeah, it's a people's opinions. One thing I've got to mention that's pretty important. I have, well, I'll talk, uh, hopefully if y'all, if, if I don't mention this next week, I'll bring it up. Got a it. lot of students want to talk about their comp versus estimated last year. No one cares. <laughs> the only number they care about last year is the actual comp. Okay. They don't care about the reported. They don't care about the estimate, all the care. So you only have three numbers you really want to focus on. You do need to maybe mention this number if it Actually, was, if it was a big difference, just explain that, but you don't have much more than that. You don't have to do, you just have to say what the difference is. And then for the rest of the paper, you only focus on the dollar too. But no one cares about the reported last year. No one cares about the estimated last year. You only care about the comp last year. And it's, right. that's why it's comp. It's the number we keep comparing to. That, that makes sense. Okay. So like, since, uh, is that gap between the reported and the, and the comp like a massive one? Or is it just like, all right, that's that's an okay gap from the uh, 875? Um, you, you could certainly go out and just see what the difference normally is. Um, you kind of have to make, you wonder if it's always the same adjustment over and over again. You can see it's all over the place though. Oh my gosh. 231%. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all over the place. So, and my guess is it's probably a different thing every single time. But it does bring in the question, why do they keep making this adjustment? What's what exactly, why do they always, and it's, you notice that it's always positive. Yeah. Until oh, there's at nine. You know, I said 90% of the time. So you got 16, or you got, uh, you got 20 out of 21 that are positive. Yeah. So that's pretty close to that 95% I was talking about. So yeah, the majority of time it's, they're adjusting it up. What the heck happened in 2015 for Walgreens? <laughs> well, something like that. If you have, um, I know with GM, it was a uh, healthcare and pension write off. Oh, they took their income from like, I forget, they wrote off $16 billion all in one quarter. It actually moved the entire earnings for the S&P 500. 
Oh my God. <laughs> um, but it's a one time write off because the pension rules changed. And so they had this massive write off all at one time. The market ignored it because there was no cash flow implications. It was entirely accounting. Yeah. The market didn't care. But yeah, their earnings went from highly positive to highly negative. But the comp number was positive, And that's what the market focused in on. Hmm. I mean, stockholders want to know that. They want to make sure there's no funny business going on. Now, they, now look here, they had consistent bunch of adjustments down for some reason. But yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, this is the underbelly of a, of, of management reporting. <laughs> and then, so like for the reported and the comp could, uh, could like some kind of estimate or not estimate, but explanation be that uh, a bunch, a lot more testing has been available for COVID at these places. So that's given them a little kind of like an extra boost for future value. Well, if it's, if it's their normal operation, you know, we're talking about stuff like a strike, um, an accounting change where you have to write off something. You sold a subsidiary and you sold it for a big loss. A lot of times it's, it's mergers, acquisitions. Oh, okay. Paying off a business. It's something that just happens once. Um, I know back um, with Theraflu a few years ago, Walgreens had a big adjustment, but I don't think they that adjusted their reported versus comp. I just think it, they had a one-time adjustment on their inventories. So I, I can't remember if they did that adjustment, but but it's, it's got to be something management really believes will not happen again or is unlikely to happen again. Okay. Um, why do they have something like that every single quarter? It's pretty significant. Um, you know, it's amazing how many times the reported is less than the estimate and the comp is greater than the estimate, but the market stock market definitely reacts to the comp. Okay, so then, if the the change, the, well, the difference between the comp and the reported, it's basically solely because of actual financial accounting or some ser like some actual statistics changed in their financial statements. Yeah, and you'll I think you'll find at least one article that tells you what that fifteen cents is. Okay. And they cool. don't always give detailed descriptions. You know, sometimes that it might be, um, you know, dollar two after adjusting for a, an employee benefit adjustment. That may be all they'll tell you. And that's all I'm looking for as you have it in there. But um, there's a lot of faith that that's the right adjustment to have made. Um, when I was an analyst, boy, I would get these adjusted numbers. And I was like, I don't know if they did it right, but they're a lot smarter than I am. I'm just starting. So I'm using their numbers. <laughs> Uh, until just you get more comfortable and you start learning the companies, you know, if you're brand new, you're like, okay, this person's been on the sell side for 10 years, only following 10 companies. Obviously he knows a lot more than I do. So I, I was very trusting back then. Now you want to be a little more cynical and skeptical, but for y'all, you know, just trust whatever the article says. Okay. Sweet. All righty. Then I think that kind of just, that just about checks off all my questions. Uh, because the reported, the difference between that and the comp, the estimate is literally just an estimate. The comp and the estimate are subjective. Uh, the SERP, that is basically just the, that was the percent change, right? Yeah, or like no, percent. it was the FG time something, right? Well, the H is their formula and they're just, you know, they're just taking the comp divided by the estimate minus one. And that's how they're getting that 592. Oh, okay. It's just percent. That's why I don't like that for gross margin because they're looking at them. They're doing that for gross margin. Um, but I don't. I don't like saying gross margin. They beat by 0.34 percent. I don't like that. So you say they beat by whatever it is. They beat by. Um, they beat by 6.6 .6 basis points. Okay. Sweet. So we don't even really need to touch on h at all really what do you mean uh, so we don't need to like put those numbers specifically in the paper instead just use the basis points on for how much yeah. they either the or leave point, yeah leave the point three four out it, it's not the way i like to show changes in percents okay cool on and the, then on I the rev <laughs> on revenue and eps you can use their number that, that's fine because they those are those aren't percents; they're dollars. Yeah. And then I, I thought I forgot it was to tell you, I, look, if you look in the title, it tells you if it's billions or millions. I probably should have told you all that. Hopefully, that oh, that's true. I'll see it. 
I thought it was hilarious that you put in the uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. Bed Bath and Beyond, I can never remember that. <laughs> because they have been having such an insane year. Like they were yeah. they were down so bad and they act they rose within like I want to say it was like five months. They rose 400%. Yeah. And that literally just got them back to where they were before they actually crashed. Well, hand sanitizers is an incredibly large portion of what they sell. Uh, is it really? Yeah, I'm pretty amazed you walk in there. It seems like a, a fifth of everything they sell are hand sanitizers. So maybe that had something to do with it. It <laughs> might just be the hobby, you know, people going to get stuff that, you know, they're around the house. But yeah, you, you would think COVID, I mean, COVID definitely helped hurt them when everything was shut down. But yeah, yeah they definitely have bounced back. Um, it's a decent a company, CEO, you know. Yeah. Huh? Oh, did they, they got a yeah. new CEO. And yeah, it's, is, it's possible they could survive. I don't think they will. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's something pretty, it's, they don't sell stuff you need tomorrow and yeah. you get it cheaper. And it's all about the same stuff and get it online or get it at HEB. So yeah, it's, I think it's going to be tough for them to survive. But. And I think, uh, I think Carlos has a question about the uh, participation points. Oh, okay. Was it on chat or? Yeah. I don't see chat on here. He, bit, he just asked, uh, what do we do for participation points? Oh, we well, just, you just submit the problem. Um, because it's in one of the videos, right? Yeah, for videos for this week, I work a problem very similar to it. Yeah. All right, cool. I mean, cool. it's not required, but at the very end, participation is anywhere from negative 5% to positive 2%. So, and it's um, always good to have knowledge. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's good to practice. Plus, you got to do it on the final exam anyway, so you might as well make sure you understand it. Oh, we have a final. I forgot about that. Yeah, second exam. Yeah. Hmm. So when is the problem due? Tomorrow evening sometime. I say six o'clock, but if it's a little late, that's not a big deal. Okay. If you haven't watched the, the video for today's class, you could actually uh, work this example problem while you're watching that video because it, it's the exact same problem but with slightly different numbers. Plus, you have to be able to do it on the finals. So. Get some practice. All right. Uh, how soon is the final, actually? It's December Where? 10th, 11th, sometime in there. It's in the solos. Oh, my goodness. We're, we're almost done. Yeah, one more month. Yeah. Oh, wow. Time flew by. Yeah. But, oh, I registered for your class uh, next semester. Yeah, so. gonna, yeah that's my favorite, my favorite class. And actually, I don't think that I need to take the fact exam to take that one because uh, okay. it and the kind of like no to the prerequisites. It didn't say anything about it. And when I emailed the people, they kind of just said, oh, if you're taking like the corporate finance, then, yeah, you have to take the fact exam. But they didn't say anything else about another class. OK, that's fine. You don't really need it for this class. But, yeah. That... All, All right. right. Well, you have a wonderful rest of your day, sir. I'm going to go grind out some homework. All right. Thanks. All right. Bye, everybody. Miles, I saw that uh, video of you doing puns. I posted something about it on Facebook, but I don't know what happened to my post. So I was trying to kid you a little bit, but I don't know where it went. So anyway, I saw that. I thought it was pretty funny. All right, guys. See everybody later. Adios. All right, bye.